Welcome, everyone, and thank you again uh, for joining us for our uh, DOE Office of Indian Energy Program Review, the first virtual program review um, that we've done. We've been, I've been involved in these since about 2002, um, and that's the first time we've done it virtually, but uh, I'm going to, um, first, uh, I want to apologize for those who have maybe joined for prior sessions, because we're going to go over the same sort of introductory slides. Um, but for those that, that are just joining for this session, um, I do want uh, to introduce the team. So, um, so by way of introduction, and for those I haven't met yet, my name is Lozana Pierce. I've been in the energy development uh, arena for about the last 25 plus years um, and have had really the pleasure and the privilege of, of working with Indian tribes for um, on their energy development for over 20 years, actually since 1999. Um, I am a mechanical engineer by degree, and I pursued an MBA in my current position as a deployment supervisor. I support the office by executing the deployment program comprised of financial assistance through our competitive grants, uh, technical assistance, which is available for tribes and el eligible tribal entities free of charge, um, and education and outreach. Additionally, I manage the National Funding Opportunity Announcement act as project officer for some of the projects you've heard this week, um, and implement some outreach through our website, emails, newsletters, um, and, um, and oversee the uh, contractor support, uh, contracts and laboratory support and things like that. Um, I don't have good pictures of James, except for um, in the lower uh, picture on this slide, uh, James is second uh, from the left. Um, and he will be helping uh, moderate the Q and A session at the end um, at the end of the uh, third presentation. So next, I wanted to uh, introduce the the newest member of the federal team. He's been with the team for quite a while, um, and I think now he's permanent. As, uh, Dr. Tommy Jones. Um, and uh, Tommy Jones is from Jones, Oklahoma. And yeah, I have to say it twice, Tommy. Sorry, I think it's funny. Tommy Jones from Jones, Oklahoma. So Tommy is a enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, Natnik Village Council, and a native shareholder of Bristol Bay Native Corporation of Alaska. Dr. Jones first joined the office as an intern while he was finishing his PhD in natural resource studies and his dissertation, which analyzed the barriers to renewable energy development on tribal lands. Also, while he is, did his in, internship, along with another intern, uh, Les Nussifer, did a report, which is posted on our website, that deals with barriers as well to renewable energy, if you're interested. Uh, since then, he has been supporting the office in Golden, Colorado, as a contractor, and has recently, like I said, joined the federal team, not, uh, not only, not even a month ago, actually, just a couple weeks. Um, Tommy will be helping us stay on time today and will provide uh, pres presenters with sort of a five minute reminder 15 minutes into their presentation. And I'm going to open it up then you can, uh, Tommy, if you want to say a few words, please. Thank you, Lizana. Hello, everyone. We've had a pretty good week so far, and we have this our last day of the, the program review. Thank you to everyone who's presented so far and for everyone who's attended. There's been a lot of great questions. And uh, it's it's been a great week of sharing knowledge across Indian country so that we can conti continue to see these improvements in the tribal communities. So again, thank you to everyone uh, for being here and uh, look forward, forward to hearing today's presentations. Thank you, Tommy. I must say, I think that picture in the top left of that slide is when he was an intern, so he was pretty young. <laughs> the ones down below were from last uh, fall, so I think they're more representative of what he looks like now. Um, next slide, please. So next, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Ms. Tweedy Doe. She's another member of our team. She's duty stationed with Tommy and I in the Golden, Colorado. Um, and she's a project officer for many of the projects uh, you'll hear about this week as well. Um, as a project officer, Ms. Doe, yes, Doe, D-O-E, I was destined, destined for her to join us for sure. She administers financial assistance awards to Indian tribes, Alaska Native Villages, and tribal and intertribal organizations. Uh, before joining the Office of Indian Energy, 
Tweedy served for eight years with DOE's Office of Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy, EERE, as a project officer under the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program for those who, you who remember the Recovery Act. Um, also with EERE, she served as a project management analyst with the Project Management Coordination Office. Before joining uh, DOE, Tweedy had uh, served, worked with the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, CERT, um, and that's when I first met her, where she, um, and she had gained valuable experience working with tribal leaders on energy and resource planning and management, um, and gained an understanding of tribal communities and their diverse needs, resources, and visions. And, and uh, she finally came home to us in the Office of Indian Energy. So, uh, Ms. Doe has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science at the University of Washington and a Master's of Arts in International Studies with emphasis on economics and human rights from the University of Denver. She obtained her P, uh, project management professional PMP certification in 2013, pretty prestigious, and is also a certified project officer and a certified contracting and officer representative. Um, and I think I'm introducing this first section. So Tweety, I'm gonna ask you if you wanna say a few words. Sure, I will keep it brief. Um, hello and welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking your time to share uh, this program review with us today and uh, I have to say that I look forward to sharing stories as well as meals with you next fall when we can safely get together. Thanks Tweety. Okay, next slide. Um, I did want to give everybody a sense of the office. Um, you know, we, we've averaged uh, since 2010 about $8.4 million we've been able to provide through these competitive grants. Um, but we're a really small office, and I'm not sure everybody realizes. Uh, um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview. This also was included in the program um, overview on Monday and each of the days subsequent to that. So the, uh, the Office of Indian Energy currently has nine federal employees, which I want to highlight because it's, it's twice as many as the four federal employees we had last November at the program review. Um, currently, there are four in Washington, D.C three in Colorado, which is myself, Tweedy, and Tommy, and two in Alaska. Uh, we also have contractor support, a couple folks at headquarters supporting Director Frost, and we have six uh, contract support uh, project monitors, is uh, primarily uh, in Colorado that support the national uh, financial assistance grants and agreements. Um, we also get support from the Golden Field Office, we are co-located with the Golden Field Office and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado. Uh, so we get procurement legal and, and need the support from, from them as well. Next slide, please. So this picture, uh, which was taken last November, it obviously doesn't have every one of our new folk, uh, but I did want to go through and sort of, you know, add face to names for those who we haven't met in person. In the back row, we have James Jensen, um, next to him is Chris Venema, both contractors supporting the deployment uh, program in Colorado. Next is Gibby Kokanowski, a federal staff member. He's duty stationed in, in Anchorage, Alaska. And then next to Gibby is Director Kevin R. Frost. He's located in Washington, D.C. In the front row, we have Jamie Alley on the far left, myself, Jen Luna, who's team lead for the contractor staff in Colorado, as well as the project in, uh, monitor. Uh, next to Jen is Tweedy Doe. And next to Tweed, we have Susan Manley, uh, also a contractor support. Uh, next is Jasmine Anderson. She supports Director Frost in DC. And on the far right is Tommy Jones. Um, so as this, uh, as I said, as this picture was taken last November, uh, many of our team, you know, uh, new, new team members are not pictured. So let me give you a little bit of an update there. Uh, since last November, uh, Gibby Kokonowski, um, has taken a senior policy advisor position, but he remains duty stationed in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, Gibby has recently been joined by Alan Verbisky, um, not shown. Alan is an engineer with a wealth of knowledge and experience in tons of different energy uh, technologies um, and energy systems. He also has experience, quite a bit of experience working with Alaska Native Villages. And since he joined the office, he's basically returned home to Alaska. Uh, Brant Petrasic, not shown, 
He's previously with DOE's Office of Environmental Management. He has a history of working with tribes and joined the office as a senior advisor duty station in Washington, D.C. Uh, Director Frost, shown in the back row, second to the right. He's been joined in D.C. by Gwentella Wilson, our budget officer, great devil budget officer, um, and uh, Paulette Toole, our uh, new management analyst. Uh, neither are shown. And as I said, a very recent addition to our office is Tommy Jones, and he's on the far right of the picture. And he joined the office of federal staff member in Colorado as a deployment specialist. On the contractor side, not shown is Jessica Becker. She joined uh, the deployment team in Colorado as a project monitor, and she's supporting some of the, the grants and agreements you will have heard from this week. Next slide, please. Before we jump into the project presentation, I just wanted to go over some event details. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on DOE's Office of Indian Energy website um, in a couple weeks. Copies of the presentation slides will be posted um, on the Office of Indian Energy's website, and I understand that Monday and Tuesday slides are posted, um, and I would expect just to, you know, early next week we'll have all of them posted. Um, it does take a little bit to transcribe the audio recordings because of requirements we have for ADA, um, so that may be a couple weeks before those recordings are available. However, everyone will receive a post-event email with the link to the page where the slides and the recordings will be located. Um, because we are recording this webinar, all phones have been muted. We will answer your written questions at the end of the third presentation, final presentation of this session. Um, you can submit your questions at any time by clicking on the question button located in the webinar control box on your screen and typing in your question. For the presenters, um, just to reiterate, please ensure that when you're not presenting that you're muted. And be aware that because of the timeline that we're on, we will be providing you a five-minute verbal reminder 15 minutes into your presentation. And we will be responding to questions received after the third presentation. Okay, next slide, please. Thanks, Monica. Um, so this is just to give a sense of, of why we do this. Um, like I said, we started, I think the first one was in 2002 under the precursor program, um, tribal energy program, um, really just to provide sort of a, a venue um, for tribes to, to share, share their story, share their, uh, celebrate successes, uh, share lessons learned. Um, and it is a requirement of the grants agreements to provide these project updates on an annual basis. Um, usually it's in person. We have great snacks and, you know, um, uh, it's a little different. Uh, but this year we're making do with the virtual um, webinar uh, presentation. So and why don't we jump to, I don't know whatever slide it is, 18, I think. Okay, so just to introduce the next uh, three uh, presentations for this session, we're going to have uh, Joshua Simmons um, present on behalf of Recon Band for their uh, solar microgrid project. Uh, Ken Hawkins uh, from Rosebud Zoo is going to um, give us an update and overview of their community solar project. And then we have Harvey and Cheryl is going to present on the Seminole Tribe of Florida's uh, Rural Reservation Resiliency Initiative. And with that, if we could bring up Joshua's slides. And Joshua, whenever you're ready, have at. Okay, thank you, Azana. And I uh, just want to thank everybody from your office, too, who is um, been supporting uh, this project and all the other tribal projects uh, out there that are uh, deploying uh, needed energy infrastructure and um, just really appreciate all that you're doing and and you know navigating uh, the, the challenges we have right now to having a normal in information sharing conference and ensuring that this information still is getting captured and shared with tribes um, so thank you uh, next slide please uh, actually you know just step back sorry uh, the uh, you know so I'm Josh Simmons I, I'm uh, serving as a technical contact for this project on behalf of, of Rincon. Um, you know, I'm uh, president of Prosper Sustainably, so we're a consulting group that uh, serves tribes 
in, in energy, uh, uh, climate, resilience, and related areas. And so I presented yesterday on behalf of San Pasquale. Uh, and in that case, uh, I was just doing it on behalf of John Flores, but we're supporting them as well. And uh, just uh, so you know, prior to this, I also was the environmental director for the San Ynez Chumash, where we had various Department of Energy grants. And um, so been, been doing this for a little while and uh, just you know excited to be able to be involved in, in these projects. Next slide, please. So the Rincon Reservation uh, is located in uh, northeast San Diego County, um, probably about you know 45 minutes to an hour northeast of, of the city of San Diego, and uh, it was established in 1875. It's about 5,000 acres uh, within the San Luis uh, Rey River watershed. The uh, it's a rural area, and as I mentioned, uh, northern San Diego owner incorporated area and uh, they have a, a variety of uh, wildlife and other uh, uh, habitat and species out there. Next slide. There's about 1,800 uh, residents and some um, some small businesses spread throughout the reservation as well as the Harris Resort in Southern California and uh, which includes um, you know hotel, gaming facility, uh, eight restaurants, spa and uh, other facilities. And uh, surrounding the reservation is agricultural, uh, so sorry, historic and current land uses include the, the agricultural uh, operations, the gaming residential, and some small uh, light industrial. Next slide. In the past, uh, so Rincon's made some progress in, the, in this area, uh, uh, and they installed about 10 years ago, one megawatt of solar that's serving Harrah's. At Harris, they've also implemented various energy efficiency measures, lighting, HVAC, and, uh, energy uh, control systems, and you know pretty much anything that's cost effective to do, they they have done so far. In 2018, they installed a lithium ion uh, battery uh, that was being leased by STEM, and that's uh, providing uh, energy arbitrage and demand charge reduction cost savings. And and finally. Uh, most recently, they've completed their strategic energy and resiliency plan. Uh, we supported them on this, as well as some uh, some other firms and other other uh, teams. And uh, and so that's kind of laying the foundation and pathway for this and other related projects. So the the exact objective for this project, the Rincon uh, Solar Microgrids uh, project, is uh, primarily to increase resilience. The Rincon is experiencing uh, increasing number of uh, public safety power shutoff events. And you know, if you're in California, you probably know what that is. If you're not, then uh, it's it's their outages that are being done by the utilities to uh, to prevent wildfires from occurring. So they're de-energizing power lines on certain circuits in areas that uh, are more forested or have uh, fuels, uh, woody fuels available that could spark a wildfire. So, you know, the, the various IOUs out here have um, had wildfires start as a result of their transmission lines. Uh, shortly after, you know, that's that's the primary driver of, of these projects uh, for the tribe. Uh, and, you know, after that, uh, lowering energy costs, lowering electricity costs is a significant factor in this. And, you know, that, that always plays a role if we can't, you know, the tribe doesn't, is it's not going to work out if there isn't an economic return associated with these projects. The tribe's also been seeking to move toward energy independence, uh, moving toward clean energy, and also wants to install infrastructure that's scalable uh, for these solutions: clean energy, lowering costs, and, and their their level of energy independence and resilience. Next slide, please. So the uh, solar microgrid projects, uh, I'm kind of uh, including a, a project, or, or a separate grant agreement we're working on with the DOE right now uh, as well, just you know, so you're aware of that, where we're, we kind of consider this to be a part, a single portfolio of projects we're working on. Uh, but there's the, uh, so there's two under this current, this specific grant agreement, there is the a fire the fire station microgrid, uh, which is just the fire station facility. They have a backup generator right now, and the project is going to be adding 100 kilowatts of solar plus a, a, a 50 kilowatt 50 kilowatt hour uh, battery, in, all integrated into a single microgrid. And that facility is a residential fire station that has 911 emergency dispatch and serves as the emergency operations center. And so that's an essential facility that's providing the critical services to the, the Rincon community. 
the other uh, microgrid that's under this project is uh, for the resort area, which includes the uh, Harrah's Resort, uh, the wastewater treatment plant that serves Harrah's, and then uh, uh, adjacent to it, although it's a separate entity, is the, the Rincon's Travel Plaza uh, gas station and convenience store. Um, and so uh, these facilities are serving as, uh, well, the, the, the casino is serving as a uh, public shelter, emergency operations center, particularly for uh, the kind of um, uh, commercial side. There, there's usually, you know, during an emergency, there can be a significant number of, uh, of visitors and guests there that uh, uh, can be managed, uh, may sometimes need to be managed separate from the travel community. Uh, so they have emergency response uh, uh, services down there, evacuation staging areas with the wastewater treatment plant providing uh, critical wastewater services. And then um, the travel plaza provides essential food and fuel for emergency emergency vehicles, standby generators, and, and water pumping stations. The uh, as of right now, we're envisioning this as a single microgrid system, although we'll you know continue to iterate as as needed. Uh, that would include uh, the existing one megawatt of solar with at least two additional megawatts of solar. Uh, there are uh, currently two megawatts of diesel backup generators there uh, serving some of the meters, uh, not all the meters. We're looking to add actually probably more like one megawatt of additional diesel generator backup capabilities. And um, a lithium ion battery, uh, as well as some other uh, storage uh, systems that I'm going to talk about just in a moment. Um, and you know, the, the, as you, this is actually the original scope of the project. The scope has actually grown with some additional funding sources that I'll get to in just a moment. And then finally, this is more of just a, a preview, although we are working on this, I think in parallel, uh, we did secure some funding or, and working on the agreement with the DOE for a separate microgrid for the Rincon Government Center. That facility was built in 2018 and is the, the hub of the Rincon Travel Government providing a variety of services, and that will be a solar plus storage, plus diesel backup generator microgrid. Next slide, please. Here's the conceptual design of the uh, Harrah's uh, air resort area campus microgrid. That includes the resorts, which has six meters, the wastewater treatment plants, uh, the travel plaza, and then um, there's also what's known as the Butler Building. Uh, that's between the wastewater treatment plant and uh, the, the the casino, and that likely will be included as well. It's it's currently one of you know technically one of the casino meters. It's actually it's uh, there there's some uh, warehouse facilities and, and uh, it's the the it's the gaming commission is housed there as well, which would during a, an emergency operations may be tapped. Uh, maybe reached out to to make some decisions regarding how to proceed with the casino. But so I mentioned some of the the you know the the critical assets we're looking to add the additional two megawatts of solar. It's looking like we may potentially expand that to even more solar, uh, up to six or seven megawatts total of new solar for um, this facility. Uh, I mentioned the lithium ion, which we're going to, you know, size appropriately. We're going to seek to integrate that existing with the existing lithium ion that's being leased by STEM as well. Um, I mentioned the new diesel generation capacity combined with the existing diesel generation capacity, and then separately we've secured a, a California Energy Commission grant for uh, almost 10 megawatt hours of, of non-lithium ion long duration storage, and these are uh, kind of, I guess, newer, least less kind of commercially read, uh, available or uh, accepted technologies, one being flywheel energy storage systems. Those have been around for a while, but are not, you know, they're, they're kind of now re-emerging uh, re as a pretty uh, viable option for energy storage that lasts uh, longer than lithium ions. And, um, and then uh, vanadium redox flow batteries uh, as well. And again, you know, kind of an emerging technology. So this was a, a CEC demonstration grant for these technologies. That's also going to provide a significant need for resilience, long duration resilience. Uh, the casino and other parts of the re reservation uh, are being shut down for a day or more. And, um, you know, they're having to, sh to close their doors and losing a significant amount of economic revenue and then also don't have the facilities available for the emergency purposes that they're needed for as well. Uh, so these, the, the project will involve fully integrating the meters and all of these distributed energy resources into a single controllable microgrid system uh, that will allow these resources to uh, serve 
all parts of the facility as as desired uh, during both on grid and off grid mode. So we're talking about a, a grid interconnected uh, system uh, that is. Uh, going to provide economic, significant economic benefits during grid operations as well. Next slide, please. Uh, here's, you know, a kind of brief uh, conceptual design uh, or simple conceptual design of the fire station microgrid. The solar is not actually going to go on the roof. Um, the, the roof cannot support it. We've later learned. Uh, so that will uh, likely have to go in the parking lot, um, either just to the southeast or the southwest. Um, and uh, those are the various assets. So this one's, you know, again, grid connected microgrid that will provide economic benefits during the on-grid mode and, and uh, resilience for when the power goes out to keep the, this critical service operational. Next slide, please. And I figured while I'm at it, I would share with you the Tribal Government Center microgrid project. Um, you know, we'll, as of right now, we you know we have this shown as being both rooftop and carports. Uh, again, we're getting some feedback that the rooftop may not necessarily be suitable uh, for it, so it may end up being all carports. Uh, I mentioned this was a solar plus storage plus uh, generator um, system. Uh, they also have some e electric vehicle chargers on site as well, which will be supported. Um, so that provides kind of a daily additional resilience, uh, transportation resilience capacity. Next slide, please. Uh, so the microgrid project partners, at least for the the major casino microgrid, uh, are the ones you know we're, the groups we're speaking with right now, and hopefully we're proceeding with. Um, well, I guess internally there is the the tribal governments. The the tribal government has a Rincon Energy Committee, that's led by the vice chairwoman, uh, vice chairwoman chairwoman Turner, and um, also. Uh, the um, attorney general is part of that, uh, and her, her the legal team. Uh, there's various uh, folks from over at Terra's that are supporting this. They they have a, a director of of te technology and information services uh, that's been you know excellent. He's been driving most of the energy efficiency and energy related uh, improvements over the past few years and uh, for taking over for uh, his predecessor. Um, so, you know, that the internal team is mainly who I, you know, serve as the, I kind of bridge the gap between them and all these other partners as well. And, uh, you know, my team includes uh, the Microgrid Institute, uh, uh, um, uh, Sage Renewables and, and Our Energy as, as uh, energy, owner's engineer representation and technical assistance. And, you know, we're, we're kind of the main project manager owner's represent, representative on this project. Uh, so we've been uh, speaking with EDF Renewables uh, for uh, uh, doing the engineering procurement and construction for at least the Harris project and possibly um, for the other facilities as well. And actually, I don't have them listed up here, but Swell Energy uh, likely will be doing at least the energy storage systems for those smaller facilities. Uh, we are also, you know, as a result of COVID and um, and even just, you know, otherwise too, uh, we've been uh looking to work with a tax equity partner to take advantage of the tax equity uh, financing, the investment tax credit and depreciation to uh, bring in more revenue streams for the project. It's also um, could help relieve some of the financial burden on the tribe, which is uh, particularly uh, um, important right now due to COVID, uh, you know, coming into this, we, that was not as, as a great of a need. Doesn't mean we wouldn't have considered this anyways, uh, but, you know, uh, being able to not have the tribe um, have to pay up, pay the money up front or, or for the match and otherwise is a pressure that would, would be uh, of great value to the tribal community during this time. Uh, so we've been speaking with them. They, they did separately did a project uh, with, um, uh, Delaware Nation in Oklahoma uh, for a, a solar farm over there. Um, so me, uh, we have yep. five minutes remaining. Great, thank you. Uh, so we're excited to work with them, and we're in both advanced conversations with them and EDF, uh, and we're being supported by Godfrey Khan, who supported uh, three different uh, tribal uh, tax equity uh, projects involving DOE funding. So you know, kind of just let you know that is a potential option to consider for your projects as well. Um, you know, uh, and and you know, was was on, and others can share more information about what the requirements are for those. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so there, you know, there's various project agreements we're working on right now. There's the engineering development and construction contracts. And we're, we're looking at in the operations and maintenance. We are looking at these as a package right now. Uh, you know, we're kind of at the engineering development phase that we need to get through before kind of finalizing the construction and operation and maintenance agreements. Uh, do the complexity of this project, but we want to consider the kind of key terms of those and whether or not you know EDF is going to be the best fit for the full uh, the full project as the uh, engineering procurement and construction firm. Um, and separately, we're working with uh, Solaris on an LLC operating agreement and the solar services slash power purchase agreement, uh, which would be merged into that we would partner them on a, a, an LLC um, to to own and operate this project. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's the you know a kind of high level overview of the major project activities. Uh, so you know we're past the the stage of uh, you know we believe of selecting the design build contractor and financier, and we're now into you know full negotiations and seeking to finalize the uh, EPC and financing contracts. And, and some level of engineering design uh, and permitting has occurred, and we'll be hopefully diving into that and, and a lot more depth uh, in, in, in the next uh, first quarter of next year. And so, and then and once that is completed, we'll proceed with uh, the construction commissioning. And then, and then once that completed, we'll proceed with the operations maintenance performance monitoring reporting. Next slide, please. All right, so the, you know, lessons learned, key lessons learned here are, uh, you know, just, Always keep it on your radar that there are opportunities to le leverage. There may be op there could be opportunities to leverage resources and secure more resources. The the tribe went into this uh, with really the primary goal of being able to get through these uh, power public safety power shutoff events and keep the casino open. They were losing a significant amount of revenue. Do that and in just shutting down other critical services. So just ensuring that those were going to continue to be operational. The the DOE grant was for two million dollars and it actually is. You know the amount of money to spend to even to kind of develop that initial infrastructure is significantly more. So the full uh, project amount was uh, is seven over seven million dollars uh, with with the match. And uh, but you know that was worth it to the tribe to be able to get this infrastructure there to avoid these outages and get at least some amount of solar. Uh, we then uh, discovered the opportunity for the California Energy Commission grants, and then there was the second DOE grant, obviously, which is you know kind of almost a, a separate bucket and separate project. There have been some state rebates for energy storage that have uh, contributed to this project to make it more economically viable and expand the available resources for the project. And, uh, and then the tax equity has been another uh, revenue stream we're working on as well. So you know, these are things where you know we didn't necessarily have all these in mind. We, we definitely didn't have all these in mind when we started started this, but you know, uh, you know it's if you build it, they will come, I guess. And and it's been great to identify and, and be able to, to work on securing and and and, and developing what really a, a more complete project is what the vision was is for eventually we'd be able to use the DOE grant to get other resources to develop a more complete system and project, more solar, more storage, and all that's happened a lot sooner than we were anticipating, which has been great. And that we've been able to kind of, you know, uh, use that to balance and, and make it more economically viable for the tribe as well. Uh, you know, the tax equity financing opportunities and challenges um, uh, are, are something to consider as well. I mean, that is an opportunity, uh, you know, we looked into loan options as well, whether federal uh, offered loans or or private, and there were some obstacles, limitations with those and some of the grant funds, including the DOE one. Uh, and then and then there are some certain requirements regarding third party finance or tax equity financing that we have to navigate. Um, uh, you know, you definitely want to define your your project, the owner's project requirements or the tribe's project requirements before design engineering, before you go into that phase. You know, you don't really want to have the engineering firm or the construction firm dictating those requirements or driving those too much. So it's worth worth doing that. Uh, recommend going with a single EPC for this size of a project versus multiple contractors. Uh, I think the saying goes, having one one throat one throat to choke if something goes wrong. Um, it, it, you you want to have there be one EPC that has full liability uh, and that you can go to when things are happening. Um, Pardon the interruption. Please sure. finish within a minute. Great. 
Thanks. Uh, um, for microgrid complex microgrid projects, electrical infrastructure costs are significant, so definitely factor that in. And uh, you know, these are a project like this is 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 very complex and uh, will likely necessitate some level of advanced engineering that needs to be paid for before finalizing the, the EPC contract because it's just too hard to predict. Uh, fully calculate and know what those costs are going to be, unlike just like a standard solar or solar plus storage project. Uh, next slide. And that's it. So thank you very much. Apologize for going a little bit over. Thank you so much, Joshua. Um, so next, next we have on the agenda um, Ken Hawkes, and your slides are up, Ken. So whenever you're ready. Please begin. <clears throat> okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, good afternoon, Lazana. I've been working with DOE for since 2003, when the tribe received a grant for a 30 megawatt uh, wind farm, and I proceeded from then on working in renewable energy for the tribe. Right now, we're on a project at the Sichango Village, a solar project. It uh, originally, well, I can go on, but go ahead, next next slide, please. I've been working with the director of uh, Tribal Indian Programs, Grid, Tim Willick, with Grid Alternatives also on this project, and along with the Housing Authority, who matched the dollars to, for the energy grant. Right here is a picture of the Rosebud Sioux Tribal Headquarters in Rosebud, South Dakota. Um, very beautiful place. This is where I grew up since babyhood. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> a beautiful place and a lot of fun to grow up in. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. It's the Rosebud Indian Reservation originally consisted of, uh, I've got that blocked out. Let me see if I can. Change this up a little bit. It consisted of 3.2 million acres originally. And then uh all the Actimicious land to a I'm trying to minimize this, and I can't seem to get it to minimize. To 950,000 acres, and every head of household was given 160 acres and every single adult 80 acres and every minor 40 acres. The remainder, fully 2 million acres, was taken away and was open for homesteading, releasing the five-county area of the reservation boundaries to one county, Todd County, is a bright dark maroon color right there on the bottom, south central part of South Dakota. We have lands um, checkerboard throughout the other counties, other four counties. And you can see these checkboard in red. Next, next slide, please. We have uh, 20 communities, 20 members of council, 35,000 enrolled members, with about 30,000 living on the reservation. Employment rates for the reservation are from 45% in the summertime to 80% in the wintertime. We don't have too much economy here except for maybe agriculture. That's basic, uh, the basic economy here on the reservation. Next slide, please. Since 2003, we've had an increase of uh, power, uh, costs for our electrical power, and a lot of our people have been suffering from it because they get their power shut off. Any given time, in the winter time, we have about 400 households out of around 2,000 get their power shut off, and they have to scramble for money to get it turned back on. 
you can see the uh, wholesale rate was changed from 2003 to this year, 2017, by 107.66%. And the consumer rate increases was increased from 56.6% higher. Uh, this has caused a lot of uh, a lot of heartache on the reservation because we just seem to use electricity a lot here, and and it just uh, the rate change is a, pretty hard on us. Next slide, please. Low income home energy assistance programs. You can see the change of cost of what the money we put out over the years from 2003 to 2017 around $3 million a year, and of that money, only about 963000 comes from the federal government through assistance. The rest of it is put in by our tribe through one form or another, either from the casino funding, wherever we can find monies, we help out the homeowners with paying electric bills. So it's a real burden on us as a tribe uh, to Two million to three million dollars a year in more in, in income that we hardly ever have, but for some reason we find a way to do it. Next slide. In 2014, we developed the Rosebud Sioux Tribal Strategic Energy Plan, an overarching living document that will align and focus the tribal energy effort provide a foundation for planning and executing key tribal energy initiatives that will lead to development and implementation of Rosebud's wide energy efficiency and cost effectiveness and self-sustainment for the long run. And to document and understand our tribal energy footprint from the residential government and business level to the agriculture level, what we do, what we use for energy throughout the reservation. We're Slowly coming together on this, uh, it's going to take some time to do it, but we want to build a tribal utility. Right now, we have a tribal utility commission that does regulatory, but we want to have an actual tribal utility that produces electricity by renewable en energy means and distributes this electricity throughout our consumers here on the reservation. Next slide, please. You can see where we're located on the reservation. Um, in South Dakota, so it's it's a good resource. The solar resource for for the tribe is is, is good, and this is kind of like the primary direction we're going right now because it's been hard. We have a lot of wind up here, very good wind, in fact, but we can't get a power purchase agreement to make it economically feasible, feasible to build either a 30 megawatt wind farm or a recent one that I worked on, which is a 190 megawatt wind farm. But that's still an option that's open to us, and we still have investors and developers who are interested, and, and we are working on doing something with a 90 megawatt wind farm north in North Antelope, which is this north of Mission Antelope area. But we switched basically to solar, and it's been working so far for us. Next slide, please. 2016, we wrote, we got a grant from the federal government. Uh, federal share was 129,766. Cost share was 131. We worked with the Housing Authority, and this house is a USDA house that was built under agreement between the um, Tribal uh, Housing Authority, uh, SWA Corporation, and uh, part of the agreement with the USDA and Housing Authority, they had to make sure that that electricity is paid every month so no damages could happen to that house in case the uh, homeowner left it or the renter left it unattended. So the, the electricity is being paid by housing, and I got them to interested in cost-sharing this project because of that. And they've seen their electric, electric bills go down for this particular 10 houses that we did. So they got a 20,000 potable, potable take rooftop system for $5,000 each, basically. And they're very happy with the results of this project. These, these houses here were a ground source loop pump, uh, loop heat pump houses. Um, and they work pretty good. Next slide, please. 
when we went after this 2018 grant, the, the 897,000, um, 100,000 project, um, Chichangu Bichokti Awayak Bay Corporation, the House, Tribal Housing Authority, agreed to chip in a cost share of 348,000. And uh, Grid Alternative is going to offer uh, an in kind in training and equipment for 100,000, which would match the federal share of 448,000. This is a group of uh, guys that worked on them, uh, 13 houses there. But originally, uh, we were going to do a 250 kW solar farm for all 30 houses plus the community building. But we ran into a snag with a uh, basin electricity and Cherry Todd, the local co op which they had an agreement to anything over 150 kW, we would have to pay a $4,000 standby rate uh, to build a 250, anything over 150. You can see at the bottom, uh, TSAF, which was part of the, part of grid alternatives, um, helped us reduce that uh, rate from housing's rate by 150,000 because they kicked in a, uh, an award for us to reduce that rate. So housing was assisted that much further. Um, and it was a great, great thing for them to do for us. The next slide, please. You can see in blue, we're going to do, this is original project plans. In blue are 30 units of USDA houses plus the community building on the upper left. We were gonna do all of them, and but as I said before, we were gonna build a 250 kW solar field at Sichango Village there. The policy by the wholesale provider states all projects over 150 kW will be charged $4,000 a month standby rate, <clears throat> which was 48,000 basically yearly. And that was basically the savings we would see if we went to the 250. So we had to basically jump down from that 250 to 150. And <clears throat> the known parameters, if RC claims those units in this project belonging to Resco, the new tribal utility, we would be required to purchase a whole infrastructure along with building the 250, along with paying the 4,000 a month standby rate, which is around 272,000 new if we put it in, and provide O&M on the infrastructure and insurance for all the infrastructure, which we had neither O&M services there. We would think we we're thinking about contracting it, but we, we backed away from that. And uh, along with the insurance for all the infrastructure. Um, Go ahead and next slide, please. We'd switch from the slide previously to the ones in blue or the dark blue will be getting a 5.8 residential solar rooftop installation. And the ones in the 17 and in in, surrounded by the green would be receiving power from 150 kW solar field. So last summer, we started on these other 13 units with uh, rooftops. Uh, I think by the, by the end of November, we finally got them installed. Next, next slide, please. These are the group of people from Grid Alternatives along with uh, volunteers locally that did get paid for them, but they volunteered to come out there and work. And my grandson is in there somewhere. I think he's in the orange on the right there. Um, he helped put them, and he liked it. He he really liked doing that work. It was different for him, and it was a challenge for him also. These are working fairly good, and these are that. Yeah, that's good. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, you can see the 13 units there from the top to the bottom. Over the course of a year. Total savings in dollars was around $11,000 that the housing authority had to pay on electric bills. You can see a couple of them are are using more electricity now than they ever did. 20, 2017 cost for that number two, 3586, 
was around 2,200 in electricity bills, and 2020 cost was 2,333.90. I presented this, I sent this uh, Excel sheet to the housing authority, and I told them, you know, there's something wrong here. All these houses are three bedroom units. Some houses are air to air, and some houses are direct electric heat uh, furnaces. And we were part, it was a two part program with housing that they were to look at these houses and make sure that they were visit the homeowners or the renters and make sure that they're they're helping us work these houses efficiently, uh, closing the storm windows and everything like that. And um, so you can see this one house used quite a bit of electricity. And uh, there was another one also that that used quite a bit, but it dropped clear down in 2017. They're they're using 3,482 in electricity, but because of the solar on it, it dropped down to 1,420. On average, it it saved uh, altogether $11,000 in in electric bills there. So housing is happy with this result here. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Pardon the interruption. You have five you minutes have remaining. Okay. So we have yet to put in the solar field. We had issues with the houses in where it says interconnection point. That whole area was flooded with subsurface and surface water. Uh, <clears throat> it has gone down since last summer to where we can put in the fence, but we're not going to start on that 150 kW field until probably July or August now. And then we'll be putting in that that connection for that particular group of 17 houses. We have a master meter down in the right-hand corner that it will feed through. And it will be the rate charge you can see right there. We do not, we're not going to purchase the infrastructure, and we're losing $30 a month because of the uh, hookup to the basic charge to be hooked up to the grid. And that's um, times 17 units, which is uh, $6,120 annual. OM, OM to be handled by Cherry Todd, the local electric company. And <clears throat> we will not purchase insurance until we buy something, until we buy the existing infrastructure. So. Insurance is being still being paid or by Cherry Todd. That's part of that thirty dollars a month. Rate charge to the SWA units will be basic thirty dollars monthly, ten point six cents a kilowatt hour up to nine hundred kilowatt hours, and nine point two cents kilowatt hour on anything over nine kW. Um, the flooding has gone down quite a bit, and they were thinking about actually moving some of those houses on the south end there. But I think that their mind has changed, and they will not be doing that. And I think <clears throat> that's about it. Um, next slide, please. We plan on getting RESCO in action soon. This is when the tribal government comes back together as a entity running the reservation instead of COVID-19. Um, We've gone through a first reading of RESCO on the governmental affairs, and we'll have to go through another reading. And then 30 days after that, it'll be introduced to the council for to be chartered as a entity within the tribe. <clears throat> RESCO will administrate a monthly billing to SWA on the 17 units. RESCO will pay the commercial rate billing on this master meter to Cherry Todd on a monthly basis of power that flows from the grid to these 17 units at night or otherwise. <clears throat> what we don't know is uh, peak power. And that will be a lesson we'll, we'll, be, we'll find out how much that will cost. And I think from that point on, we're thinking about actually um, putting battery systems there and try to control some of that excess electricity that we produce in the daytime and either put up small wind to also build up that uh, battery system. So we will be subject to peak demand charges. and We don't know what those will be. We haven't had accurate numbers to even make a guesstimate. Next slide, please. And you can see right there, area stated, 
Plate of Fort Wood had water surfacing and flooding area along with some crawl space flooding and concern by local housing that possible moving of those affected by the flooding. I think that has kind of gone away because it pretty much dried out. Next slide, please. Next, okay. After a cycle full year, production on anticipating solid energy storage to shape peak demand costs, conduct cost analysis on return investment on complete disconnecting from the grid by addition, addition of energy storage, electrical production by propane generators and community sized wind turbines if needed. Next slide, please. And that's about it. This is our contact information. And this is Tim Willick's uh, contact information. And they do a great job with tribal projects. And uh, we want to enter another project with them, again, similar to this one, but with the intent of actually providing energy storage and uh, trying to be disconnected from the grid altogether. Uh, that's about it. That's all I have. Made 20 okay. minutes. <laughs> okay, Ken. Thank you so much. And thank you for reminding me how long we've kind of grown up together, nearly 20 years now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's been 20 sit, years. Make, it's been a while. And you, we're still both at it. So thank you again. Yeah. Um, next time, good. You, you bet. <laughs> uh, next time, good. Bye bye. Bye. I'm going to um, invite Harvey and uh, Carol to give us uh, an overview of their uh, their project. So you're on whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Cheryl Jacoby. I'm the interim executive director of finance for the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And what I'm actually going to do is turn the presentation over to Harvey Rambrath. He is the assistant director of community planning and development here at the tribe. And he is actually coordinating the efforts to oversee the design and construction of this project. So Harvey, I'll turn it over to you and you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, this is Harvey Rambrath reporting from the Sunshine State of Florida where it's currently 75 degrees Fahrenheit on the outside. Um, that's just to have state envy for anybody who's um, freezing out there. Anyway, um, I borrowed this uh, slide from uh, the NREL, which is the National um, Re Renewable Energy Laboratory. And in it, it shows um, the potential for solar energy generation. And even though Florida is a sunshine state, um, you can see that the states to the west um, and so it has a much greater potential for generating energy. Um, uh, the term used there is direct normal irradiance, um, which is like a measure of the amount of energy you can get from the sun um, striking the earth. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so this um, this map was borrowed from the Energy Information Association, um, and it shows the type of energy that um, is um, produced, that is used to produce uh, energy in electrical energy in the state of Florida. We have a few coal plants, uh, quite a few solar installations, nothing on a grand scale. We have a couple of nuclear power plants, um, some natural gas, most of the majority of them are natural gas or biomass, where we burn. Um, uh, for, not fossil fuel, but uh, the fuel from uh, landfills, et cetera, in order to generate energy. And that's the, the, the various symbols represent um, where they are located. Florida is the third most popular state behind California and Texas with approximately 21 million people. Um, it is the second in net energy production behind Texas but we still do not pr produce enough energy to meet our own demands. Um, and on the bottom there, you see the utility scale, um, utility generation, the bulk of it is generated from natural gas. Uh, next is coal-fired nuclear. Renewable is only 2.7%, and petroleum-fired 0.2%. Um, the state of Florida is the third in energy consumption behind Texas and California. Next slide, please. This map shows the location of the Seminole Tribe Reservations and um, 
you can see that we have a, a very big reservations like the Big Cypress Reservation and the Brighton Reservations. And then we have some smaller ones like Fort Pierce and Tampa um, and Hollywood, which is the main reservation. But overall, the tribe um, has about 90,000 um, and 30 acres land base. And they are approximately 4,240 members. And the project we are going to be working on will be in the Big Cypress Seminole Reservation. Um, yes, in the, towards the center of the state. Next slide, please. The Seminole tribe um, exercised authority, sovereign authority over territories in Southeast from time immemorial. It resisted US political and military removal efforts through the 19th century. It was reorganized under the Re Indian Reorganization Act in 1957, and uh, IRA Section 16 Tribal Council governs the Seminole Tribe of Florida, and Section 17 Board of Directors manages the business, the business arm of the tribe known as Seminole Tribe of Florida Inc., or Stuff Inc., um, for abbreviation. The tribe is recognized for leadership in advancing sovereignty. It um, was, it had its, the first smoke shop in 1976 and the first high stakes bingo in 1979. Next slide, please. So why renewable? We have a dependence problem. Right now, the tribe depends on outsiders for energy, for governmental operations and economic development. It has no authority over state regulated utilities and are subject to rate increases and supply interruptions, um, similar to what was presented earlier. Um, the tribe's ability to plan long-term is impaired because of unknown future energy costs. Next slide, please. So why renewables? The tribe depends on energy provided by state, state regulated utilities, which are based off reservation. We have grid reliability issues, um, especially in the rural reservation areas. Um, energy from fossil, fossil fuels is expensive. Prices are likely to continue to climb. And overwhelmingly, the utilities produce energy by burning fossil fuels that create greenhouse gases and other emissions. Next slide, please. The cost problem. We talked about um, the retail prices that the utility charges the tribes are being high and they're generally increasing. And even though natural gas has been cheaper, electric rates have um, continued to rise. And when uh, more and more people leave the grid and go off grid using um, renewable energy, uh, the cost is likely to rise um, for the people who remain on the grid. So next slide, please. In 2017, Hurricane Irma made landfall and impacted the entire state of Florida. And even though the tribe's reservations was uh, spread out throughout the, the south and central area of the, the um, state, all of the reservations were uh, impacted. Um, it, Irma was very uh, powerful and catastrophic. Um, several facilities across the tribe's reservation sustained severe damage. Next slide. The tribe had to close and discontinue its government operations for several weeks, and in some cases months, until recovery. In the Big Cypress Reservation, there are approximately 680 residents. Um, who were particularly impacted by the grid res resiliency issues and outages. Um, the, the, it took over two weeks for the power to be restored. And um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Uber, the tribe was the largest purchaser of propane and diesel for generators in Florida, because um, we provide generators for all of our residential um, homes. Um, so in January 2018, the chairman of the Seminole Tribe and the and Tribal Council formed the Renewable Energy Committee with key people across the tribe, including a representative from the chairman's office. The committee was charged with ensuring power continuity across tri critical tribal operations to the greatest extent possible during and after a storm. 
and for identifying solutions to mitigate and limit power outages as a result of a storm, and identifying opportunities that will allow the tribe to be self-sufficient as possible in meeting its energy demands. Next slide, please. And that's what sort of sparked this project. Um, and we, we had applied for a, a, a grant from the Department of Energy and were successful in getting this grant. And now the, the project summary for this um, project is to um, effectively address its, the significant grid resiliency vulnerabilities, especially on its rural Big Cypress Reservation, which has experienced significant and repeated grid outages. And uh, as we said earlier, frequency of outages has required all tribal facilities to rely on backup generators. Next slide, please. The scope of the work for this project. Um, we intend to install about 445 kilowatt of solar facilities and 1,510 kilowatt um, hours of battery storage, uh, including transfer switches, control systems that will serve four essential facilities in the Big Cypress Reservation. Um, we have issued an RFP for a contractor to design and build the integrated system at the four essential, four essential facilities and the bids were received on 12-14 and we are now reviewing them. Next slide, please. So even though um, the Big Cypress Reservation is um, uh, over uh, 52,000 acres, the majority of the, um, the development occurs in a concentrated area, as you can see in this slide. And um, the four facilities that we will be focusing on, uh, our efforts on are the Big Cypress, uh, Frank Billy Field Office, which serves as the, um, the main administrative office in Big Cypress, the Senior Center, which is located next to the, to the field office, the Health Clinic, um, which is opposite it, and then the um, Big Cypress Public Safety Building, which is a little further to the north. Um, next slide, please. Okay, this shows a close-up view of two of the sites, the Frank Billy Field Office and the Senior Center. For the Frank Billy Field Office, um, we were originally going to be doing ground-mounted solar panels on that area to the, um, which is shown sort of uh, with, the, with the blue striping and uh, the sort of peachy color area. That area was is right now it's um, virgin land, but instead of doing car, Instead of doing ground-mounted solar, um, we also needed to expand the parking lot for this area. So at present, we are working on expanding that area and creating a parking lot. And the, the solar contractors is going to be installing solar panels in that area on carport, uh, carports. So um, that area, we expect to generate 100 kilowatts, um, and we will have a 320 kilowatt hour battery backup, uh, which will be interconnected to the generator and the grid. Um, for the senior center, we intend to install um, carport mounted uh, um, solar panels um, uh, in that area, which is shown in the, rec the blue rectangle to the west. Um, we expect to generate about 40 kilowatt of, um, of energy from those panels and we will be attaching that to a 150 kilowatt battery backup. Um, and again, this is gonna be interconnected to the, to the generator. The idea is that um, if, there's a, if there's an interruption in power, these solar panels and the battery would be able to run the facility for at least three hours before the generators would have to kick in. So the majority of interruptions are less than three hours. So for the most part, we do not expect to have the generators being kicked in. But if it does, when the generators do kick in, they will be charging the batteries as well as powering the building. Once the, once the batteries have reached a certain level of charge, um, the batteries will take over again, provided that the power is um, still interrupted from the grid. But um, 
the the idea is that it's like a um, an interconnected um, system that will optimize the energy efficiency of this of these facilities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for the Big Cypress Medical Clinic, a health clinic, this one um, it's it would look like we could have done the carport mounted panels on the on on this parking lot as well. However, um, there is um, exfiltration trenches under that parking lot, which probably would be affected um, or compromised by those carport mounting um, solar panels. So we we looked at the, the options. The roof is a fairly new roof, and it's in good shape. We did the analysis, and um, we expect by placing solar panels on the roof, we should be able to generate about 170 kilowatt of photovoltaic energy. And if, if that's not enough, we can use the parking strip that is to the southwest of the building. Um, we expect to be hooking up this um, facility to a 640 kilowatt battery hour, kilowatt hour battery um, backup. And um, again, it's right next to the generator. Next slide, please. Um, for the big Cypress, um, the public safety complex, here we were able to get some of the solar panels ground mounted in the area shown to the east um, in, in uh, that orange goldish color. Um, and uh, we, ex we expect to also have to use some carport mounted solar in the area shown in blue. The idea is to generate about 135 kilowatt um, of photovoltaic energy and have Pardon a 400 kilowatt hour battery. Pardon the interruption, you have five minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. So, next slide, please. So, the project participants are the Department of Energy, uh, of Indian Energy, um, the Chairman and Tribal Council, Executive and Senior Management Staff. Um, our current consultants are Baker Tilly, and we have been working with Cindia Labs as well. Um, to assist us in preparing and reviewing the RFP. Um, Glades Electric, which is the corporation that provides electricity for the Big Cypress Reservation and tribal members. Next slide, please. Again, we talked about the objectives, providing reliable electrical energy in the Big Cypress Reservation, reducing our reliance on fossil fuel, reducing the tribe's carbon footprint, and we expect to save over $3 million in local utility energy over the life of the project. We'll also be training six to eight tribal members on construction and at least four tribal members on operations and maintenance of solar PV systems. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello, can you all hear me? Hello? Hello, I can hear you. Yeah, next slide, yeah. please. Harvey, I think you're I... on it now, procurement slide. Okay, sorry. <laughs> right. The RFP process will select a design build contractor and require that solar installation com um, company must have sig significant experience in installing solar PV systems. Um, we expect them to have substantial experience in designing, installing, and interconnecting solar PV systems, transfer switches, and control systems with battery storage technologies in Florida, and have substantial relationships with multiple equipment providers to ensure timely delivery of equipment. Next slide, please. Um, the project was let out to bid on October 14th. The, the bids were received on 12-14th. We received three bids, which are currently being reviewed and we anticipate um, the bid award in the first quarter of 2021. And here is a look at the schedule. We are hoping to have a contract executed um, by the end of January, um, having detailed side drawings by end of April. Um, construction should begin um, sometime in May, and we expect it to be completed by September, and we are hoping that when we do this report in December, uh, hopefully in Colorado, um, that 
we will have our system up and running and we can give you some idea as to the amount of energy we are producing. And I added a third annual reporting back in um, 2022 because I think we have to provide two years of reporting. So thank you. Uh, next slide, please. I thought it was a good way to end the presentation by quoting um, a Native American proverb. Um, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children, and it is our responsibility to leave it a better place than we met it. Next slide. Thank you. Any questions? I did it in under 20 minutes. Okay, thank you, Harvey. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, and thank you for the other presenters. I am going to pass it over to uh, James Jensen, who's gonna moderate the questions. James? Thanks, Susanna. All right, so we have a few questions here. We have about 15 minutes. I, I expect we'll have time for more, so please submit any questions that you have. Um, we'll start with, with Josh on the Rincon Casino Microgrid project. Um, you mentioned the, the flow battery and flywheel storage. Uh, I think it's funded outside of the, you know, the Office of Indian Energy Awards, but can you talk a little bit more about those technologies uh, versus the lithium ion? Are, are, they, are they truly just demonstrations at this point or is there economic reasons to choose them? Um, great question, uh, thank you. Uh, so the flow battery and flywheel, um, I think are viable in the market so long as you, you know, it, it's more of, you know, you gotta run the economics to see if it works for you. Uh, the kind of main differences between them, so lithium ion degrade over time as they cycle and they have a limited lifespan. They typically warranted for 10 years and maybe last up to 15 years, depending on how frequently they're cycled. Uh, the flow and the flywheel don't degrade. Uh, they're both kind of more, their expected life cycle is actually, you know, 20 years or so. Um, the lithium ion uh, uh, can, is you know very commercially accepted has um, you know instantaneous response uh it has controls capabilities to allow itself to kind of island seamlessly flywheel uh, responds very quickly as well um but the kind of controls haven't aren't quite there at least on with the, the firmware working with and i think it's just you know still they're still working on more of the islanding capabilities it can it can provide islanding uh support but it, it can't it's not really you know, instantly grid forming uh, technology at this point, or at least not, it's probably capable of it, but just not at that stage at this point. Um, those are, you know, buried in the ground. They take up more space versus uh, a lithium ion. Uh, but, you know, I think for the appropriate use case at the appropriate price, they can they can make a lot of sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, for more long duration outages, we're looking at uh, there are a better case where lithium ion isn't really as well suited to long duration outages. Uh, flow batteries can't instantaneously can't instantaneously respond. Uh, they're you know they're they're actually uh, made up of, of various inert uh, chemicals or, or fluids that um, you know store and release energy based on combining and, and uh, undoing uh, the, the 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 combination of the fluids. Um, you know, it can respond quickly if the if the pumps are already running and the liquids are flowing, but if they're not, it takes a bit of time for the for it to get going. Uh, and you know, I guess unlike lithium ion, which you know has potential uh, hazards associated with the chemicals that it uses, and you know, thermal runaway and and flywheels, which are uh, large, and you know, if it they goes out of control, it could rip through uh, so a building, and that's actually happened. But uh, you know, obviously, the safety of technology has been something that's been worked on. Um, Flow batteries, uh, you know, they're large containers, but if, if they broke the chemicals they released would actually be, you know, not they're not hazardous. Um, so, you know, just kind of various considerations for considering these technologies. And ultimately, I think, you know, the use case comes down to space, size, what, what you're using it for and what the cost ends up being. And I, like Liam I, I do hope to see both flywheel and flow batteries uh, get uh, lower costs over time. Great, thanks, Josh. Great summary on those technologies. Um, 
can you talk a little bit about any regulatory challenges you've had uh, with development of these projects? But once again, Josh, and your um, portfolio projects there. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I think, you know, we're still somewhat some of the beginning phases of of it. Uh, um, one, two things right now uh, that, uh, you know, are things we're, we're going to need to resolve is uh, we, we're looking to expand the solar field. So having the uh, two megawatts of carports at, at the at the Rincon campus, at the Harris campus. And then uh, we're looking to expand the solar, uh, I believe, additional uh, four or five megawatts over in a field to the east, uh, which is across, uh, a, I think, a state road or state highway, Valley Center Road. And if this was, if this was off reservation, if you cross a right of way, then it would the a solar facility would actually be deemed to be a utility and would be subject to utility regulations. So, um, but since it's on trust lands, uh, you know, we believe it doesn't apply, but, it, you know, something we're going to have to navigate with the CPUC and, and hopefully, you know, we, we can work it out and we're going to look at, uh, you know, prior cases on that. Uh, the other, you know, regulatory thing we're, we're handling, which is more budget related, is that the, uh, it would be more cost effective to acquire stg and E's San Diego Gas and Electric's transformers for the project as opposed uh, as opposed to, re, you know, removing those and replacing those with our own, uh, but acquiring that equipment requires SDG, or sorry, uh, California Public Utilities Commission approval, which could potentially be, you know, challenging to get. Uh, but, you know, for uh, both of these were the beginning phases of of re doing legal research and and uh, figuring that out. Um, you know, beyond that, I guess, you know, more on the uh, tax equity side uh, to consider is uh, the, you know, regulatory navigation with respect to uh, making the LLC work in terms of capturing the tax equity benefits and being able to flow some of those benefits to the tribe or, and those, as well as actually uh, state tax exemption, too, is another one where, you know, we're trying to navigate to, to the best benefit of the tribe and even working with the DOE in terms of ensuring that we uh, set up the LLC or do this this transaction in a manner that's consistent with DOE regulations uh, that uh, apply to these grants. Great, thanks, Josh. The question now for uh, Harvey or, or Cheryl: um, the lithium the lithium ion batteries that oh, well, first off, are they lithium ion batteries that you're planning to use, and will they be used to prevent export of energy to the grid, or will they primarily be used during outages? Um, I guess I will have to answer that question. With regards to the type of batteries, we haven't we haven't um, specified a type. Um, we did uh, just specify the capacity that we need in order to um, to provide for the needs of the building. The these facilities will be connected to the grid um, because we cannot go off grid in the state of Florida as yet. Um, once there is a utility available, so the idea is. Um, that when, for the most part, the solar panels are going to be charging the batteries. When the battery is fully charged, um, what we're going to be using the batteries for will be um, a peak power shaving, peak demand power shaving, where at the time when the, the, um, the rates are higher, we will have the, the battery be running the facility and then when the rates are lower, we'll use that to recharge the battery. So that, that's that's part of the, the use for the batteries. We do not anticipate that the batteries will be used to backfeed the grid, um, but it will be interconnected. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think that's most of it, Harvey. I, I think um, the one question would maybe be is solar being sold back to the, the utility um, or will the batteries prevent any excess generation? Well, the, the, the way it works is that um, if, you're, if you're providing more energies and the building facilities using wood from the solar panels, um, that energy will be fed back to the grid um, and it's, it's sort of credited. It, it's, um, uh, it's, it's an interconnection. Um, where basically you pay for the net amount of energy that you're using. Um, for the most part, um, I think that we expect to be able to save around 30% or reduce the energy consumption 
by about 30% for each of these buildings. Great, thanks, Harvey. Sounds like um, you 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 you're obviously still evaluating your bids. How many responses did you receive in your RFP? I, you can share. We received that. three bids. We received three bids. Our purchasing department should be sending them out to us and to be a tele for evaluation today. Great. Um, a, a question for for Josh. Uh, how did you? Uh, Solicit your EPC contractor, and um, and what metrics are you looking at to select them? Um, well, it's kind of a, a bit of a long story. I mean, we we went into this uh, looking to do a full procurement, but due to COVID and due to uh, um, some support we needed in getting in some uh, uh, self generation incentive program rebate applications, uh, including uh, support and deposit, um, we ended up. It ended up being more of like a sole source type situation uh, to the circumstances, um, you know, where, you know, exchange for uh, doing some of these things on behalf and putting some money up front, uh, they had to have exclusive negotiation rights. Um, so, you know, but we're, that is, so EDF right now has exclusive negotiation rights for this project, uh, you know, subject to, you know, in, in good faith on, uh, on both sides. Uh, for the project and so you know we're gonna have to seek other ways to kind of validate pricing and ensure we get what we want but you know we have a owner a pretty robust owners representative team uh to do that and uh should be able we'll seek to validate it with a, the market of pricing that we uh know about um i think that answers your full question i i yeah. have another part to it oh that that's great um Another question probably for you, Josh, uh, it's a question about tax equity and tribes not paying taxes. So how do they monetize those benefits um, with a tax uh, equity partner? Yeah, well, I'm an attorney. I'm not a tax attorney, so um, I can't tell you the nuts and bolts, but you, it, it involves partnering with a, uh, a, a tax liable entity you know, that has the tax appetite and, um, and then the lawyers make the magic work. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty standard model though. It's not, it's not unique to tribes uh, and it's been used again and again and has been accepted by, by the IRS. And so, um, you know, it's just more about identifying the appropriate attorneys. And in this case, you know, you also have to uh, navigate the, the DOE grant requirements as well to ensure your compliance with those. Great, thank you. We got one more question here. It's also for you, Josh, um, and and you may or may not be familiar with it. But um, have you looked at Energy Vault, which is a system using concrete blocks and gravity to store energy? Uh, no, I've uh, I feel like I've heard that Energy Vault before, but I'm not familiar with that technology. Harvey, I don't imagine you have anything to add on Energy Vault. But chime in if you do. Um, with that, that's our last question. Um, so, Lizana, we'll just wrap it up and pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you again uh, to all of our presenters. So this. Uh, this concludes uh, this session. Uh, there is one more this afternoon. Um, and we made it through three full days, and now we're at the fourth day, so we're 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 in the home stretch. Thank you, James, for for that. And um, if you are joining, um, attending the next session, you will need to join using the link and call-in number you received when you registered for that session. I would like to remind folks that the presentation slides will be posted in a few days again on the DOE Office of Indian Energy website. Um, and the recordings uh, will be available within about a week or two, and everyone who registered will get an email to that effect. So that concludes this session. Again, um, thank you so much, uh, Joshua and Ken and Harvey and Cheryl. Cheryl really appreciate uh, you taking the time to share with us. And that concludes the session of the 2020 Virtual Annual Program Review. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you very much, thank and happy everybody. holidays. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.